over at bangthebook.com. We are your one-stop shop for sports betting news and information. Tons of great stuff being posted by a very strong group of writers over there. We've got Danny Vorgs' updated NFL power ratings for week 11 and his model projected final scores that went up here this morning. Another edition of Parker Michaels' daily NHL picks went up this morning as well. Parker is on fire. So make sure you head on over to bangthebook.com. Check out his article today and every day because he shares a lot of phenomenal information in the NHL betting markets. My college football power ratings went up earlier on in the week. Got ongoing situational betting tips for college football, college hoops, the NBA, and the NHL. Got a preview for tonight's Michigan State Seton Hall college hoops game. Got a bunch of NBA content for you as well. Lots of good stuff going on over at bangthebook.com. Your one-stop shop for sports betting news and information. And make sure you check out our Bang the Book YouTube page as well, where we got some free pick video content up for you for the weekend here. As you know, this and every edition of Bang the Book Radio, presented by our friends over at DSI Sportsbook, BTB and the number 200 is that promo code. 100% deposit match bonus for the sportsbook, 100% deposit match bonus for the live casino at BetDSI. It's only a game until you bet it. One guest on the program today, but he is a very good one. Great buddy of mine, Mr. Brad Powers, professional handicapper over at bradpowersports.com. Brad, how's it going today, man? It's going well. How are you doing on this fine Thursday? Doing very well, buddy. Appreciate your time as always here, sir. And uh, look, I'm excited because tonight we have something other than Maction to pay attention to because, man, that conference is terrible. <laughs> yeah, uh, although, I mean, I, I have a little bit of a uh, fondness for the Mac, considering, I mean, one of those schools is my alma mater, so yeah, the, and well, growing up in that three points area, last but, night. Yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, other, I mean, the quality of football is certainly not there, and uh, it's tough at least getting a read uh, on some of those teams, because uh, the, a lot of inconsistencies, to, not only from week to week, but uh, I mean, from season to season, it seems like when I was there, it was almost like the golden era. I mean, you had Roethlisberger at Miami. Urban Meyer was at BG at that time. Northern Illinois was really good. I mean, it was so good that that, that Mac football and Gary Pinkle was at Toledo that, I mean, college game day actually came to Bowling Green for, for a week. So uh, it's certainly <laughs> fallen in the last 15 years since that time period. Yeah, it definitely has. And, of course, losing head coaches like a Dave Doran, like a Matt Campbell, uh, you know, those are things that have kind of hurt this conference. And quite frankly, I think when you look at a couple of guys, you know, in action here that we're going to talk about, we're not going to talk about Buffalo, but Lance Leopold's done a great job at Buffalo. Um, you know, maybe Mike New kind of turning things around there at Ball State. Jim McElwain's going to use Central Michigan to springboard to another job. We will yep. talk about that Central Michigan Ball State game here in a few minutes. But, you know, the Mac, it's just uh, it's, it's very difficult to talk about on a weekly basis. So fortunately, we won't do too much of that here in this segment but we start on friday night as we roll through our game breakdowns here game 315 316 louisiana tech and marshall very interesting line move here in this game with marshall going up from two and a half to as high as five out there in the market yeah i'm against the line move and i'll have to dive in further and see what what, what's uh you know going on with it because i mean i'm closer to like two two and a half which is where it was towards the opener and, you know, I've been a big – I've used Louisiana Tech several times. I've been on them. I started the season on them in the Texas game. Unfortunately, that was a loss there. But, I mean, obviously, that was their last loss as far as straight up since week one. And uh, I know they haven't played that great of a schedule, but the offense is really gelling. 52 points per game their last four. Uh, it, it could be a, a rematch in the Conference USA Championship game. Uh, I'm on La Tech here. No, number two and a half, it's crossed right to a key number three. Uh, I'll probably even bet the Bulldogs. Uh, that, that's how much I like it. Yeah, I'm actually trying to see. I, I don't know if there's some sort of injury situation here driving this line or, or what the case may be. But, you know, like you said, I mean, I know you, we've talked about Louisiana Tech a few times here on the show this season. They've been a team that you've been on, a team that you've liked. I think Marshall's one of those tough teams to figure out this year because year in and year out, they're generally pretty good. They're usually very consistent. They had the one year with the bad turnover margin. I want to say it was 2017 uh, where they had like a three-win season. But other than that, they've been very reliable, but so has Louisiana Tech. So I mean, my number's four and a half. It did move towards my number. I'm not going to have a play on the game, but you know, again, at this time of the year, 
it's very hard to find injury information, very hard to find out if teams are maybe going towards a youth movement, something like that. You've really got to do your research here. And it's tough because time is so limited with so many people doing college basketball stuff. The youth movement is a very critical part because I, I would assume that this might be the week where we start to really see it, you know, with the, especially with the new rules only being in their second year. Uh, the, the fact that you can play four games and still preserve a year of eligibility, I'm guessing that those kids have already played a game or two uh, so far. And the, I think some coaches, if it's going to be a lost season, you're going to see them use, utilize those guys that much more so. Yeah, that's something, especially this week and even really next week, that, that is relatively new to the market. And it's, I think, going to be something that's inefficient in the marketplace that if you're really you know, diving deep into it, you can take advantage. That's an excellent point, because I was thinking about it in terms of coaches kind of planning for the following season. But I forgot about the red shirt rule, and that could play a really big role here over the yeah. last few weeks of the season. That's an excellent point there by you. And again, You've got to try to dig for this information. If you see a line move that maybe doesn't make sense to you, go and find out why. And, you know, I don't think these two teams obviously aren't going to be playing around with anything like that because they do have some conference, uh, you know, championship hopes. But you know, that will be a thing for some of these teams here as we go forward. How about the other game on Friday night out in the Mountain West, 317-318. Fresno State's a one-point favorite against San Diego State. San Diego State was laying, what, 17 and a half last week and lost outright to <laughs> Nevada. That was a weird game. Total of 39. Nevada hadn't looked very good, but you know, they come away with the victory there in that one. I, I got to admit, man, I don't know about you, but I don't know what to do with either one of these teams right now. Yeah, I mean, I thought we saw some consistency with San Diego State. I mean, prior to last week, their only loss was what uh, at home to Utah State. But, I mean, that, that certainly threw a shock to the system, losing to what the market perceives to be a really bad Nevada team. I've been on Nevada a few times, but it, last week wasn't one of them. Uh, it, it's weird because both teams do it in different ways. I mean, obviously San Diego State, I mean, is really pathetic uh, on offense, but defensively it's certainly been there. I mean, that's one of the reasons if you've just been blindly betting the under in San Diego State games this year, you're 8-1. and one. I mean, their games are averaging only 35 total points per game. I mean, that that's incredible. I, I – I can't remember seeing a number that low in a long time in college football. Um, the Fresno State's defense uh, is really wearing down 500 or more in three straight games. I mean, I got San Diego State one here, so I, I'm I'm leaning with the Aztecs here. I think wrong team favorite. I, I think so, too. My line's only San Diego State minus a half a point, though. So both you and I kind of there in that coin flip type of scenario. Not a whole lot of reason to get involved in this one with – so much other stuff going on here, not just in college football, but again, you've got a full Saturday slate in college football, full Saturday slate in college basketball. There's value to be had. Go ahead and save your money. Don't chase that Friday night game in the Mountain West just because it's on late. You have nothing else to do. You know, you're sweating the game into club or whatever people do these days. Uh, don't don't do that with that game. Not one I would hire. Not one that I would recommend. Sounds like you feel the same way. We go to Saturday here. Game 319-320, West Virginia and Kansas State. I've got some takes on this game, but I want to hear yours first with Kansas State, a 14-point favorite. So my number is like 15 and a half. But what worries me a little bit is, you know, both teams had kind of misleading performances last week. Uh, Texas, I mean, Texas really, you know, after they got down 14 nothing, really controlled that game against Kansas State. And I think they were getting ready to run away with it because Texas had scored 24 unanswered, and Kansas State gets like a 98-yard kick return touchdown to just to stop that momentum r right then and there. If they don't get that, how mm, <laughs> much? I don't think they cover, and we might be talking about like a 17-point loss. So think about in the marketplace how Kansas State be treated if it was a 17-point loss instead of a last-second loss. On the other side, I mean, West Virginia, not only were they minus four in turnovers last week, but they were stopped on downs three times inside Texas Tech's 25-yard line. So that's basically like seven turnovers that, that West Virginia had. Moving the football wasn't an issue. They had 550 yards. Uh, now they have been struggling running the ball. Uh, I actually lean with the over here, uh, and, but it's only a lean. I don't have anything significant, and uh, you know I'll do the old, I'll hang up and listen to your thoughts. Well, I, I don't want to put you on the spot here, so I guess you can look this up unless you already know uh, while I'm talking here, is Jared Deggie going to be the starting quarterback for West Virginia here? 
You know, I heard whispers last week because I actually do uh, a, a weekly hit uh, with the guys that actually beat writers that cover West Virginia. And they were e- expecting, uh, you know, D- Deggy to, you know, play a lot last week. Now, last week they, he just got named the, the backup. But I, I haven't seen anything that's, uh, you know, concrete that he's going to officially start here. Because Austin Kendall's had this interception problem throughout the year. He's got 10 of them now yeah. after two last week. It's been a big problem for West Virginia. And I actually was higher in the market on West Virginia early on in the year than what we were seeing with some of their numbers. But it got to a point where I just I couldn't bet them anymore. And here they've dropped five straight. Turnovers playing a big role in a lot of them. One of the reasons I do like West Virginia here this week, though, and whether it's Kendall or Daggy, I'm, I'm not sure that matters so much in terms of my handicap. But for Kansas State here, TCU, close win. Oklahoma, you're blowing them out. Then you let them back in the game. You figure maybe there's a little bit of a letdown factor in the Sunflower showdown against Kansas. There isn't one. They blow out the Jayhawks. Big win for them. Last week, the close loss to Texas. At some point, you can't keep giving your best effort. I think this is a letdown type of week for Kansas State. Again, it's very tough to back West Virginia because they're probably going to give Kansas State some extra possessions here. If it's Daggy, I'd probably feel a little bit better about it. But I just don't know if this is the week emotionally where Kansas State gets margin and covers 14, 14 and a half. I like it, man. That, that strong handicap. You swung me. I, I was, you know, on the fence here. Power ratings were leaning Kansas State. I, I, I think I put exactly a 14-point margin in my newsletter this week. But uh, you, you st- that, that's a good enough handicap for me to, to swing and lean West Virginia. And again, we'll, we'll have to look it up and see, you know, if it is Daggy or if it's Kendall. Again, if it's Daggy, I mean, he doesn't have this interceptionitis that Kendall clearly has. So maybe that would be the type of spot where I, I would like West Virginia, maybe even a little bit more there in that one. How about we go to game 333-334 here? Louisville and North Carolina State. Louisville, three and a half, four-point road favorite here in this one. Remember, Louisville had been a sharp darling for several weeks in a row. They play Miami. Money comes in on Miami with Louisville off the bye, and the Hurricanes take them to Truck City in that one. But now we've got a little bit more interest in Louisville this week. Yeah, it, it was funny last week because, I mean, I I was kind of the anti-Miami crowd, although turnovers played an issue in that one. Uh, although, I mean, when you're getting crushed, you're getting crushed. It, it is what it is. And, you know, I only have a one and a half here, and, and I think I'm probably still too high in the marketplace on NC State. But, I mean, NC State – has covered just two games this season. I mean, ATS margin, ATS margin for them is, I mean, minus 10 points per game. That's third worst in the country. And obviously the last two games haven't been a good look for NC State. 99 to 20 in the last two games alone. That's what they've been outscored. Uh, You know, they Louisville just needs one win for bowl eligibility. I think they get it here. But but I I don't want to lay more than a field goal on the road. Hey, you and I have got a pretty big difference of opinion here in this one. I've actually got Louisville by a touchdown here. Oh, wow. And see, the thing of it is, and I've talked about this. I talked about it in the context of the Browns last week. I've talked about it in the context of Florida State. It's really hard to get low on some of these programs that have talent, have a reputation, or in the case of NC State, have a really good head coach in Dave Doran. That, you know, I, I want to give them the benefit of the doubt. I know they lost a ton from last year. Finley. 1,000-yard running back. I think they had 2,000-yard receivers last year. You, you want to give a team like that the benefit of the doubt because Doran's done so well. So I understand why you're digging in a little bit with NC State. Maybe I got too high on Louisville as the rest of the market did. Um, but this is one of those games where something just feels weird about it. You know, at this time of the year, you may have power ratings overlays, but motivation is a factor. Teams giving a best effort week in and week out is a factor. Maybe Louisville's just not as good as we thought. Maybe NC State's not as bad as we thought. I, there's something about this game that smells a little bit off. Let me ask you, I mean, since I, I got the actual number on yours, what stack ranked, where, where's Louisville ranked, and where's Louisville ranked in your uh, – where's Louisville and where's NC State ranked? And let me pull up my power ratings here. Um, you know, it's one of those things where Louisville has been a, a, a big rapid riser for me here so far this season. I know you and I have kind of talked about them a lot. I've got Louisville 41st in my power ratings here, okay. and I have NC State 85th. All right, so it's more on the Louisville side because I got Louisville 56th and NC State 78th. I, I just, you know, I 
really respect your opinion. So, uh, and I love gathering information and opinions. So, all right. Uh, I will uh, take that under consideration moving forward. Because I, I, I've been higher on NC State and been getting, you know, I haven't necessarily had a bunch of plays on NC State, but uh, certainly power ratings plays uh, have been uh, relatively strong on NC State, and I've gotten my teeth kicked down my throat here. I will say this, obviously. When, it, when you talk about Louisville and when you talk about NC State and the teams that they've recently played, Boston College hung 45 and ran for like 485 yards or whatever on them. But Boston College has a very good running game and an elite running back in A.J. Dillon. We know Wake Forest has a good offense, even if they were overrated because how bad their defense is. And Clemson is obviously Clemson. Louisville doesn't have an offense the same caliber of those three teams, or at least doesn't have an elite element to its offense like a Boston College does with the running game. So I can see that. I can see this being kind of a step down in class to a degree for NC State. A little bit, but I mean... Uh, it, we'll, we'll see. Cause I mean, I think Louisville is pretty good this year. And obviously last week was probably one of their worst performances in the entire season. So, uh, I'm not highly confident. I, I'll probably even get more aggressive with NC state. I mean, this is a game where, you know, if they, even that they lose by seven or so, like closer to your power ring, I'm not afraid to make a point, point and a half adjustment and keep lowering NC state. I got them more than a touchdown down since the start of the season. All right, so we go to game 335-336, and obviously there's a lot to talk about here with this game. If you're somebody who's not well-versed in this business, and, and I'm sure that there are some people that listen to our show that are trying to learn, and you know we try to set up our show in a way that works for seasoned handicappers, novice handicappers, everybody, I think a lot of people would be very surprised to see Iowa a three-point favorite against an undefeated Minnesota team that just beat Penn State. but there is a method to the madness here, isn't there? Yeah, certainly. I mean, let's just talk coin flip games. 50-50 games could go either way. Great disparity between these two teams. I mean, I was 1-3 and three in those games decided by seven points or less. Minnesota's 5-0, and oh, including last week. I, I mean, they were impressive last week. There's no question about it. An outright upset went over Penn State. They jumped on the Nittany Lions early. But, I mean, Penn State also gave them a couple turnovers, interceptions, got stopped on downs inside the 10. Uh, I just, uh, to me, at Iowa, because uh, of losing a bunch of coin flip games, Minnesota winning a bunch of coin flip games, that says value on Iowa. Also says value is how is Minnesota going to handle success? I mean, that's their biggest win in 50-plus years last week. How do they handle it this week? Uh, that, and that's not one of my biggest questions, but it's certainly a factor. And, and – uh, Outside of Penn State, who in the hell has Minnesota played? I mean, just I mean that was their first top fifty game, uh, a game against a top fifty team. I was played the much tougher schedule. My power ratings say four and a half here. I'm on Iowa. I bet Iowa. It's one of my top plays of the week. Yeah, Iowa twenty sixth and Sagarin by strength of schedule. Minnesota seventieth. And here's the funny thing. You know, I was going through and putting my lines together. I was putting together my power ratings on Saturday night, then on into Sunday morning. And initially I had Iowa minus three and I'm like, no, that can't be right. Like that, that just seems too high on this game. So I made some adjustments with both teams, wound up with Iowa minus a half a point. Sure enough, the line comes out Iowa minus three. So I'm kind of kicking myself for not sticking to where I was, but I agree with you. I think that there are a lot of factors pointing in Iowa's direction here and the strength of schedule discrepancy being a big one. And like you said, you know, it's one thing to win one of these one-off games. It's another to have this newfound set of expectations and sustain that level of play. If Minnesota does it this week, more power to them. That's awesome. Good luck against the Buckeyes in the the Big Ten Championship game. If they don't, well, maybe we find something out about Minnesota this week. Yeah, good call. And just... You know, where I wasn't overly surprised was, I mean, my power ratings were, said Minnesota was a play last week. Like, there was like a two-point difference. Line was six and a half. I had it like four and a half. And even though I thought it was kind of a coin flip game and I was impressed with Minnesota, I upgraded Minnesota a point and a half from that game. So I thought I was being aggressive with their upgrade, even though I, the, my eye test said, hey, they could have easily lost that game. Uh, and, and the fact that there's now a disparity between going against them, I mean, that that's why I'm just saying there's value. I haven't been very anti-Minnesota this season as far as my power ratings, and I thought I gave them the benefit of the doubt upgrading them. That's why I'm th- thinking I'm seeing value. 
We'll see. I, I'll say this. P.J. Fleck was one. We, we opened the, the segment up talking about, you know, Matt coaches. He's one of those Matt coaches that's no longer there. Uh, he, he worries me a little bit from a motivation aspect uh, <laughs> because he can play the disrespect card. We're unbeaten and we're a three-point dog at, at Iowa. So that would be my concern here. Yeah, uh, P.J. Fleck is, is fantastic. And, and I think there are some questions about Kirk Ferentz and if he's evolving this Iowa program enough to what the new look Big Ten actually is. But again, man, I mean, this is just one of those games where I, I'm actually surprised we haven't gone to two and a half because I, it sort of implies to me that the risk managers that are out there expect Iowa sharp money if it goes to two and a half. Because the public yeah, is agree. on Minnesota. And yeah, I mean, yeah, the public betting percentages are certainly on Minnesota. I, I think you can hold out a little bit. I, I think we might see a two and a half, I, I, but I don't think it lasts long. No. And, and if it's a two and a half, it probably comes in a square kind of book, too. Yeah. You know, I, I'd be uh, Pinnacle's not going two and a half here. Matchbook's not. Westgate's probably not. You know, stations out there in Vegas or you know maybe some of the operators in New Jersey or a Bovada offshore. That's where you're probably going to find a two and a half if you are waiting for one here on this game speaking of two and a halves we've got one here game 339 340 central michigan and ball state i started the segment talking about how you can't trust anybody in the mac but these have been two of the more trustworthy teams in the conference yeah certainly and central michigan who i thought i had power rated higher than the marketplace coming into this season is even exceeding my expectations they were one of my most improved teams and Kudos to Jim McElwain uh, for doing. I thought it was a good hire, and uh, I mean, certainly it's proven to be so. But also, Mike New, kind of back against the wall for Ball State this year, has come through and looking to to get to his first bowl game possibly. Ball State's got their run game going as of late. In their last three, they're averaging nearly 300 yards uh, per game. But uh, their run defense kind of got run over against Ohio and Western Michigan. Central Michigan's offense has been really good no matter who's at quarterback. I mean, 38 points per game in their last five. But with that being said, mm, I mean, my power ranks say Ball State six and a half here. Uh, so that's a huge overlay. I, I have to bet Ball State. Yeah, it, it's such an interesting thing, too, because Central Michigan going through the two different quarterbacks here. They had David Moore, then he got suspended for popping a positive uh, PED test. They go back to Dormady now that he's healthy again. And they've still been very, very strong. I don't know about you, man, but I have Central Michigan up 13 and a half points in my power ratings from the start of the year. Is, is that about where you are? I'm only, and maybe that's the difference. I'm only eight and a half. But I thought coming into the season, because I bet Central Michigan week one, I thought they were off like three or four points in, in that opening game against an FCS opponent. So I thought coming in, because I thought their season win total was a little light. I thought I was like three, four points ahead of the market on Central Michigan. Maybe I haven't been aggressive enough, and maybe that's just an overall theme. Maybe I'm not aggressive enough in my power ratings changes. I mean, I got this one, Ball State, two and a half. So I'm, I'm right there in line with the market. So I guess we'll see how this one plays out and see if it does wind up going closer to your number here. We take a jump down the board to game 357, 358, Navy and Notre Dame. I'm sure you expected that we would talk about this game especially with the line move, maybe coming down from double digits to seven out there, seven minus 15, the lowest price on the fighting Irish at this point in time. Yeah. And this is my biggest power rings disparity of the entire season. I mean, I got it like Notre Dame 16. (laughs) So, and I haven't been high on Notre Dame at all. In fact, I've been very anti Notre Dame. Uh, I got Navy upgraded more than any other team in the country. Two touchdowns. Maybe, I mean, this line saying I should have Navy up three touchdowns. And, I mean, if that's the case, if I put Navy up three touchdowns, then we're treating Navy like a top 20 team. And this line's kind of saying they're borderline. I mean, that their AP ranking is closer to what their Vegas rating is. I mean, may, may, Navy's off a of bye. They've done well in South Bend. They're 12-2 and two against the spread their last 14 visits. I mean, if you look at them statistically, I mean, they're top 12 in yards per game differential, points per game differential, yards per play differential. But the reality is, Adam, I mean, they played one top 40 team at Memphis. They lost that game. That's their only loss of the season. And, I mean, I know it was several weeks back, but weren't they catching like 10 or 11 to Memphis? And now they're only catching a touchdown at Notre Dame. I don't understand it. I bet Notre Dame. I actually bet Notre Dame at a worse number. I'm embarrassed to say it, but I'm on Notre Dame here. 
I got this one 11 and a half. So it's not as big of an overlay as yours is, but yeah, I mean, I, I can't disagree with anything that you said there. You know, you, you've got some teams here, even this late in the season that just haven't played anybody or have one legitimate data point. And this is a, I mean, this, this game is a big deal for Notre Dame. I know they're not going to the college football playoff. They can't win a conference, this and that, but in this service Academy game is a big game for them. And Boston College next week at home, not that big. On the road at Stanford, Stanford's down a ton. This is a a big type of game here for Notre Dame. So it wouldn't shock me at all. What does shock me is the nature of this line move. And again, I understand Notre Dame's going to have a limited number of possessions here with which they'll have to be very efficient offensively. But I am surprised to see all the way down to seven here, still this early in the week with more than 48 hours until kickoff. Stunned by it. I mean, obviously, I'd consider it to be sharper money, but uh, I mean, we'll see. I mean, sharper money isn't, it's not like it's 65%. So uh, against the spread. Uh, let me ask you this How much have you upgraded Navy on the season? Let's see. I have Navy 32nd in my power ratings right now. I know you mentioned that, you know, this line kind of implies they're like a, a top 20 sort of team. So I definitely don't have them that high. I've got them a 73 and a half in my power ratings right now. And that's up from 55 over the summer. So I have an 18 and a half point adjustment All right. in the Navy. Well, then there's, you know, and I, I've i kind of hypothesized that that maybe, you know, I should be up that high. I was just, mm, I just, I'm not, maybe I need to change in the, and I'm going to have to take a long, hard look at it. Uh, I'm just not built to, to I mean, uh, upgrade teams that significant because, I mean, to me, it just I, I don't see teams traditionally moving, you know, to more than 10 to 14 points from one season. But I mean, this could be the case where this team's three touchdowns better off of what was an historically poor season a year ago. I mean, Navy was three and 10. That was their worst season since Paul Johnson got things going at the start of uh, this century. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things, too, where I, I was very low on them coming into the season. I'm, I'm trying to run back through my spreadsheet here and. Look at the season win total projection that I actually had for Navy because it was low. It was 4.24. I don't remember what the market was on that one, but I was very, very low on this Navy team coming into the season. Uh, They were at five and a half under minus 125 for the season win total. So I was well below the market at that point in time. And part of it, too, was that I thought, well, now that they're in a conference, they've really struggled. Teams are seeing the option more often. It's been a problem for them. I want to be low on this team. Turns out I was way too low, and it seems like you know you were pretty low on them at the start of the year as well. So, again, yeah, I mean, hey, you know, it's also one of those years in college football where a lot of teams kind of beating each other and, and stuff like that. So, again, yeah, adjustments probably do need to be made as we head on into next season here. We go out west to the Pac-12. Game 359-360, Arizona State and Oregon State. And yeah, we talk about injury information, the importance of that. Is Jaden Daniels going to give it a go this week? Yeah, he is going to play here. I mean, hence, the, that's why Arizona State's favorite on the road. Uh, you know, last week they did. I mean, that was unfortunate. Got didn't get reported until Friday. And, I mean, I had already bet Arizona State early in the week. So, I mean, mm, that, that, that I've, I've lost more games with late information quarterback this year than any other year probably combined. Um, you know, the final score looks close to the line. But, I mean, SC did outgain Arizona State by like 200 yards and, SC was up significantly in that game for a majority of it. Uh, I, I mean, they need to win here. They've lost three straight in Arizona State. Uh, I mean, now it's starting to get to the point where they've been stuck on five wins for a while. I mean, they, they need to get the bowl eligibility. Oregon State's still fighting for it. They need to win two of their last three. Uh, you know, if you can tell me I can get a full three, I'm leaving Oregon State. But it looks like a lot of the marketplace is coming down to two and a half. Yeah, I think it's a tough one. I, I had such high hopes for Oregon State last week. I had high hopes for Oregon State offensively last week against a Washington Ugh. defense that had really struggled, and that was awful. I mean, that was as bad as it gets offensively for Oregon State. Do they do better here this week against Herm Edwards? They should, but you know, to what degree is the question there in that one. We jump big way down here, 377-378, Texas and Iowa State. Again, in the open, I talked about not really knowing what to do with the Mac, not really having the Mac accurately rated here throughout most of the season. In a lot of cases, I haven't known what to do with the Big 12 this year. I feel like I haven't had a good handle on really any of these teams here over the course of the season. And even here, I've got Iowa State a double-digit favorite. The market is at seven. 
I'm at like eight and a half, but I went against my power ratings. I'm going to take Texas, and, and here's why. Uh, so these two teams have played 15 times since 1980. Iowa State's never been favored over Texas, never. And so to me, uh, to have an historic outlier, and it's just not their favorite. I mean, they're significantly favored. They're a touchdown favorite. So, so in that instance, Iowa State's got to be historically great. Maybe, maybe not. I mean, statistical wise, they might. This might be the best Iowa State team we've seen at least in the last forty years since Earl Bruce was coaching them back in the late seventies. Uh, on the other side, is this you know historically poor Texas team? I don't. I know that's not the case. So, uh, I mean, here's to me. Uh, I think it's an ego type of game. I'm Texas. I, I I've worked over Iowa State. I worked over Matt Campbell the last couple of years. In fact. Matt Campbell, 69% against the spread in Big 12 play. He's 0-3 against Texas, and his offense has only managed 23 points, not points per game combined in three games. I'm a four- or five-star kid at Texas, and I'm getting a touchdown to Iowa State. I mean, that, that personally, that offends me. So, I mean, that's just how I think. But I, I'm on Texas. Even though my power rings say Iowa State's to lean here, uh, just from a motivation situational, and I'm just looking at historical outliers. I'm on the Longhorns here. Well, and also you look at the spot for Iowa State. I mean, it was the right call to go for two. It, it absolutely was. I, I know that you've got Oregon on their heel or Oklahoma on their heels, and people are saying, oh, you know, why don't you just take it to overtime? No, you, you don't take it to overtime against Lincoln Riley and Jalen Hurts and that Oklahoma offense. You try to win the game right there, and you didn't do it. And – that's got to be tough to come back from. And you're playing a Texas team, and I'll go ahead and let you rattle off the numbers because I'm sure you've got them handy. You're playing a Texas team back in its preferred role as an underdog under Tom Herman. And for Texas here, there's no look ahead to that Baylor game next week. You know, I mean, yeah, it's a big game for you, but there's no look ahead to that because you want this game. So, I mean, you've got a Texas team back in that role where they tend to thrive with their head coach. Texas is the only way I could look here, again, like you, going against my power ratings. I don't think I'll play it, but it's the only thing I would do if I was in a, an ATS pool or something like that. Yeah, and Herman's 14-4. and four. It doesn't sound that great now. I mean, he's actually been 500 as of late, so it was really good there for a while. It's kind of been 500 since, uh, or at least the last four or so, four or five games. Uh, I mean, you go way back to when he was actually an offensive coordinator at Iowa State. He's, his teams are like 25 and four. So that's a little bit more impressive there. To me, it's not, I think that gets overrun. It's just the, the, this actual game for me to, for Texas to be a touchdown underdog against, and, and look, Iowa State hasn't been able to, to really, I mean, they've gotten margin a couple times, but I, I mean, the, the, a lot of their games have been close and they just haven't won those games. I mean, they've lost four games by a combined 11 points. So, I get all that. I get that Iowa State's, you know, better than their record shows. I, I get that they're an analytics darling because they're in the, in the top 20 of yards per play and stuff like that. I, I just, I mean, I got Iowa State as a top 20 team in my power ranks. I do think they're legit. I, I just don't get them laying a touchdown here. I, I just don't. Let me slide back a few spots here on the board game. 371, 372. I accidentally overlooked this one, both in sending the notes over and then also here going throughout the show. Georgia and Auburn. Georgia, a three-point road favorite here against Auburn. This game doesn't seem to be getting a whole lot of fanfare for being a top 15 type matchup. Yeah, I'm on I'm on Auburn here. And it's one of my favorite plays of the week. Uh, I mean, I... Auburn's played the much tougher schedule. Uh, I think uh, the Sagarin ratings are two against 52, so that's significant this time of year when you got two teams playing in the same conference. Auburn's off a bye. Auburn's off a misleading game against Ole Miss where they missed like a bunch of like three field goals. They settled for five, missed three of them. Georgia offensively, last four games, 22 points per game. 22 points per game, and now this is the best defense they've seen all year. And I get it. Georgia's defenses look good, and statistically, they're really good even on the season. But two of their last three sh games, they've had shutouts. Against who, though? A third-string quarterback for Kentucky that's basically a wildcat converted wide receiver and a backup quarterback last week in Missouri. Uh, I just, I mean, they've kind of obviously benefited from that defensively st stats-wise. And then on the other side, I mean, the scary thing is Bo Nix against this Georgia's defense. Bo Nix, the quarterback, obviously, for Auburn. 
But he's certainly, Bo Nix, been better at home this year. 60% completions, road 50%. So it makes sense that a true freshman young quarterback is much more comfortable and better at home than he is on the road. And I just, I think upset. I, I think this could be the week, you know, after the, the, the big game last week, I think we're due to have a monster upset or two this week. This one won't be a monster upset, but it'll certainly throw a, a kink into the playoff mix here with Georgia being number four in the rankings. I like Auburn outright. Well, and that's the thing. You know, I, I mean, I understand all the reasons you like Auburn. I'm not going to disagree with any of them. The sticking point for me in this game is Bo Nix versus Jake Fromm. And, you know, can Bo Nix outplay Jake Fromm? Does he need to outplay Jake Fromm? But when you look at Georgia here, 6.65 yards per play on the season. I've watched a few Georgia games, watched them against Florida, watched them against South Carolina. Jake Fromm does not impress me. There's nothing downfield. There's nothing to challenge any opponent. A lot of the big plays are just Georgia wide receivers getting in space, making things happen. That's much harder to do against an Auburn defense that's fast and going to be bunched up and forced Fromm to beat them over the top. You mentioned the buy from Auburn. Man, I think that's a huge factor here in this game. I agree with you. My line's minus three, but it's Auburn or nothing here. And, and I agree. I think if you like Auburn, you go ahead and look for the, the money line reward. Yeah, well, I think that's certainly the case here. And, and you have your lines, Georgia three. Power Georgia rating. three, yep. See, I got Auburn one. So, the, I mean, I'm – and we've hit on – like, I don't – I have, like, like six, seven games this year where I have a power ratings that disparity. I think we've hit on, like, almost every one. So, so it's interesting – that uh, we've hit on those games this week. All right, so let's see if you got one here in this game. Game 381-382, Oklahoma and Baylor. College game day down in Waco. Oklahoma laying doubles in this one, 10 or 10 and a half, depending on where you look, up from nine. So the early activity has been on the Oklahoma side. Eight and a half, so I don't have a huge disparity here. I want to play against both. Uh, I mean, and statistically, you know, that the wise guy stat yards per play. I mean, they're both in the top 10 if you're, you're doing the differential between the offense and the defense. So that's strong. And Oklahoma's number one in that category. But I'm worried about the Oklahoma defense. And look, Lincoln Riley's forgotten more about football than I'll ever know. But I, I don't see complimentary football being played, you know, with offense and defense. And here's what I mean. The Oklahoma running backs – the last three games, 42 carries, not 42 carries per game, 42 carries in three games. All the running backs combined, 42 carries in three games. And to me, that Oklahoma defense, which had shown improvement at the start of the season, is looking like last year's defense the last couple of games, giving 40-plus to Kansas State, 40-plus to Iowa State. And I worry about them wearing down and towards the end of the season here. But on the other side, I think I just got – Oklahoma's overrated. Baylor's overrated. Four games by six points or less, they've won. One and two overtimes, one and three overtimes. They never led TCU last week until overtime. You can give me that whole, you know, Destiny's Darling type thing, but, I mean, I think they're relatively overrated. So I, I don't have a strong play. If I do get ten and a half, maybe I'll have a pizza money bet on Baylor here. But, but other than that, I don't have a significant uh, want or need for action in this one. I do have an overlay here, and I've got Baylor plus oh, wow. five and a half in this game. And it's partially because the market has loved this team. And maybe that's something that I do wrong as we're talking about making adjustments and, and kind of having some, you know, come to football Jesus moments here on this week's segment. I think that's something that I do incorrectly is that when I see that a team has been a sharp side a few weeks in a row, I probably end up over adjusting them. Because all the things you just outlined about Baylor are correct. Close games against Texas Tech and TCU. I don't think Charlie Brewer is healthy. He certainly didn't look 100% in that game last week against TCU. So I probably do have Baylor inflated a little bit too much, artificially inflated, because I'm almost moving my power ratings on the steam that we're seeing out there in the marketplace. And, and maybe that's not the right way to do it. So maybe this game should be closer to seven, seven and a half, eight, eight and a half for me like it is for you. I, I can't take Baylor here, though. I think it's not a good spot for them. I think Oklahoma's offensive explosiveness is something that Baylor has not seen all year, and I want to see how they react to that. I want to see how Matt Rule does reacting to that situation. The other thing I will say, much like last week's Oklahoma-Iowa State game, I'm perfectly fine with the winner of this game being the Browns head coach next year. 
<laughs> there you go. Yeah, I mean, I, I like both guys quite a bit. So, yeah, I, 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 I don't know if I wish that on any of those guys, though. I think they seem like two good guys. Stay in college, guys. All right, so again, 383, 384 here is one that the listeners asked me to talk about. Memphis and Houston. Memphis up from nine to ten and a half out there market wide. The tens that are left have extra juice attached to them. Full marks to Houston, man. I thought they were going to quit on the season with the whole De'Ara King thing with Dana Holgerson on the hot mic. All they've done is be really competitive in most of their games here the rest of the way. Will they be competitive enough to cover against Memphis this week? I think they will. I mean, I'm closer to the eight range uh, as far as my number. So uh, you, I think you hit the nail on the head, and, and that's almost exactly what I wrote on the game in, in the new, my newsletter this week. I mean, they nearly pulled an outright upset over SMU, one of the better teams in the conference. I thought they fared quite well against UCF uh, in an easy cover for them in their last game. Both teams off a bye here. You know, Memphis probably starting to feel some pressure here. I think they're in really good position to, to get that major bowl. Keep in mind that they do host Cincinnati late in the year. Memphis is going to be probably a short favorite there. Uh, and then the two teams can play each other the very next week in the AAC championship game. So that would be something intriguing to look forward to as we move along. I don't see a tremendous amount of value, but but I'd certainly, if you told me I could get 10 and a half, again, this would be another pizza money type of bet on Houston. I got this one seven and a half. So you and I are in the same range here. And I'm not sure what the overlay was for the listener, but he mentioned having a pretty big one. I presume it's probably on the Memphis side here, um, but I, I could be wrong. But glad we got a chance to talk about that game and work that one in. The other game that the listener requested in the same email was Michigan State and Michigan here. Game 387, 388, and then we'll transition over to the NFL side. Michigan's laying 13 and a half here against Sparty. And really, I mean, this is a point of pride game for Michigan State. They'll make a bowl because they'll beat Rutgers in Maryland. But you think? Really love to make. How do they lose to Maryland and Rutgers? I don't know, man. How do they lose to Illinois up twenty five? Yeah, well, Illinois is better than Rutgers in Maryland, though. Yeah, I agree with that. Anyway, I mean, I got Michigan. Yeah, I mean, I got Michigan. This is another one of those games, and we hit on most of them this week. I got Michigan like seventeen and a half. I got it. Maybe. Yeah, I, I mean, and I've been high on Michigan State routinely in the marketplace this year. Not all, all games, but majority of them. And maybe I got aggressive with the downgrade last week. I think a lot of guys in the market said, well, they, you know, it was a lot of fluky things with last week's game that they probably should have won. I, that The way they lost that game, I mean, I don't know how you pick yourself up. I mean, you already lost your best defensive player, your heart and soul on that side of the ball. And Joe Bocci busted for PEDs. You already have off-the-field issues and scandals going back the last couple of years with Michigan State. Uh, I mean, I love Mark D'Antonio, but to me, I mean, I think the ship is sailing, <laughs> and it's sailing away from the shore when it comes to his you know, career there. I get it. I mean, other people are going to say, hey, Michigan State's owned this series. They're 10-1 and one against the spread, but that 1-8 non-cover was last season when Michigan dominated Sparty, even though the score doesn't say it, 21-7, but I watched that game. I think Michigan State had less than 100 yards on offense. I, I like Michigan off a of bye here at home. They got an opportunity to step on their throat uh, on little brother. That hasn't been the case here for a majority of the last decade plus. They do it. Big house, Michigan, minus 13 and a half. Love it. I like it too. And as much as it pains me to say that as an Ohio State fan, because it, it makes me sick and I'm going to have to go take a scalding hot shower after we finish recording here. But also for Michigan State, Brian LaRookie gets hit in the head last week. Apparently oh, yeah. passes concussion tests. Throws a pick six immediately. You know, there's a lot going on, and none of it's good with this program right now. And again, I mentioned Ference, and I, I talked about this with a, a buddy of mine who follows the Big Ten very closely, Pat Fitzgerald, Kirk Ference types, although Iowa, you know, they do what they do very, very well. But with what Michigan State has to contend with now in the Big Ten East, I can't help but wonder if the game has just passed D'Antonio by. And that Michigan State, this is the new Michigan State until they make a change. I can't help but wonder if that's the case. Yeah, I think that is. And keep in mind, when Michigan State was really, you know, achieving a lot of success there, Michigan was way down. I mean, Rich Rodriguez, Brady Hoke, I mean, they were certainly down there. And Penn State was, you know, going through some downturns. Uh, you know, the start of the James Franklin era wasn't great. They were down scholarships. So, I mean, when two of your flagship programs were down, 
certainly that helped Michigan State. Both of those programs, Michigan and Penn State, are up. I mean, somebody's got to take a step back in that East Division. It's not going to be Ohio State. I mean, Ohio State's about as rock solid as any program in the country the last 20, 25 years. But, uh, yeah, I, somebody had to take a step back, and certainly it's been Michigan State. Could be a discussion for another week, probably a discussion for next week when Penn State plays the Buckeyes, but could it be Penn State? Penn State taking a step back? Yeah. yeah I mean, I'm not a huge James Franklin fan, but, I mean, they've done okay. But his recruiting has been a little bit of an issue the last year or so. So maybe, uh, I mean, but the, the, I the, I guess by step back, I mean, what, what are you thinking? Nine? I mean, they're going to win 10 games this year. Yeah, that's true. That's true. I, and that's the problem, right? In the Big Ten, you're graded on how you do against Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State, Wisconsin. You know, so, I mean, you go eight and four and lose to those four teams. Is is that a bad year? Is that just an expectation? I, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it, kudos. I mean, the Big Ten coaching has gotten way better. I mean, when you add like a guy like a P.J. Fleck and Scott Frost hasn't shown it yet, but I think it, it'll start to show next year. Uh, I mean, a good youth movement there uh, on the Western side to, to get that. Paul Chris is probably the most underrated coach in the entire conference at Wisconsin. I just think, you know, from a coaching aspect, uh, the, the the entire conference has improved uh, over the last five, six, seven years. Yeah, I completely agree. We transition over to the NFL. We'll talk about a couple of good coaches here. Game 469-470, New England and Philadelphia. The Patriots, three-and-a-half-point favorites coming off the bye. Philadelphia also off of a bye of its own. We see some fours out there at the very public shops in the offshore marketplace, but Three and a half, the predominant number here. What is Brad Powers thinking about Patriots and Eagles? Uh, here's three things. You got the ultimate trifecta, although it's probably building on this line. But you got Belichick off a loss, 66% since 2002. This is against the spread, 66% off a loss. Belichick off a bye since 2002, 56% against the spread. Belichick with revenge, 64% against the spread. And, and I use 2002 because, to me, that was the season that New England became public. Why? It was their first season off their first Super Bowl. Defending Super Bowl champs routinely start to get, you know, more public action. And yet you got 66%, 56 64%. Uh, those three, I, I, I can't go. I certainly can't go against New England in that spot, even though traditionally I don't want to lay three and a half on the road. Uh, those are, those are all excellent points. And, and, the same thing kind of applies to Philadelphia that applies to some of the college football teams we just talked about. I have no idea what the hell this team is, and it's week 11. I just I don't know. Yeah, I mean, some of it's been they haven't been healthy, and they're still not healthy offensively. Defensively, they've gotten a little bit healthier. Uh, they certainly have a lot of upside, and, you know, motivation should be there for them. I'm not saying, you know, New England's got a motivation edge by any stretch. I think Philadelphia's going to be sky high, both teams off a of bye. Uh I just, I don't know. I, I do know one thing. I don't want to go against Belichick with those three things. I just don't. Yeah, you're not. And the, long term, you don't make money. Just routinely, you don't make money going against Belichick. You certainly don't make money going against him in those three spots. No, that's that's definitely true to say the least. Let's go to Sunday night football here. Chicago and the Rams, 473, 474. Rams laying six and a half here against Chicago, making the long trip out to the West Coast. Two very disappointing teams here this season, by and large. Any thoughts on this one? I'm on the under. Uh, I mean, you look at the – I think the Rams are compromised on the offensive line. They're down three offensive linemen. Two of those guys got hurt last week. The Rams' offense hasn't scored a touchdown in 19 straight possessions. And if you're banged up on the offensive line, do you really want to go up against Khalil Mack? But on the other side, I mean, oof, Chicago offensively. I, I know some of their final scores look okay, but – Certainly, the first half for them have been atrocious recently. I mean, I think they had one first down total in the first half against Philly. They were able to get a couple touchdowns late when the game didn't matter. They got a couple touchdowns late when the game didn't matter against New Orleans. I think that's inflating the number. I think this is a rare instance. Yes, it's a low total at 40 and a half. But, you know, how much different are, are we dealing? How much different is Chicago from, let's say, a Pittsburgh last week? And we saw that final score with the Rams. And that was even with defensive scores, multiple defensive scores in that game. I mean, this could be 13 to 10 type of game. And I'm on under 40 and a half. Again, probably a discussion for another day with more time, but I'll just go ahead and float this out there. 
has the shine worn off of Sean McVay? Is this oh, yeah. just a, okay? I was, was going to add some qualifiers, but I guess I don't have to. No, I mean, I think it has. I mean, not only performance wise, but I mean, by all reports, he wanted the Jared Goff deal. That's a hor- horrible deal at this point. You can't tell me you can't go out with, with the quarterbacks. I mean, who would you rather have right now, Jared Goff or Kyler Murray moving forward? Kyler Murray. Exactly. You can't tell me you can't go out and find a, a, a good, solid quarterback on a rookie deal that, that could be better than Jared Goff. That's a horrific deal. We already know the Todd Gurley deal is going to be one of the worst contracts in the NFL. Two really bad contracts. I don't like the Rams moving forward. Uh, and, and I'd ask you this, you know, moving forward, who would you rather have, Sean McVay or Kyle Shanahan? No, oh, I love Kyle. I have a man crush on Kyle Shanahan, so there it's go, easy then. for me. So, I mean, if I'm buying stock, I'd rather have Shanahan stock than McVay. The, the McVay stock, it's already going down. I think start selling it. I mean, because it's only going to go down further, in my opinion. Which is hilarious because you've got how many head coaches in the NFL, four or five, off the Sean McVay coaching tree? Or, you know, and how are those guys? Mindset? I mean, Kingsbury's done a really good job at Arizona. Record doesn't say it, but against the spread does. It, it, he's exceeded expectations. But Cincinnati, I mean, that that's as least qualified as a coaching staff as I've ever seen in, in the NFL. And that's saying something when you got the Browns. Yeah. Jay Gruden got fired. So there's that. Yeah. You know, I mean, Sean McVay was a branch of his coaching tree, but, you know, from the same type of mindset, I know I I totally agree with you there. All right. We go to Monday Night Football. So we go down to Mexico City, 475, 476, Kansas City and the Chargers Chiefs three and a half, four out there, depending on where you look. But again, this game in Mexico City, which adds a real element of intrigue, because keep in mind, Mexico City, much, much higher in elevation than even Denver is. Yeah, and I just think too many moving factors for me to get heavily involved. I mean, I think in-game, maybe uh, I'm thinking defenses get tired, uh, maybe over. Uh, in-game running, uh, live betting, second half. Uh, you know, the Chargers are practicing this week in, in altitude in the Denver area. Kansas City, not. They're just treating it like a normal practice week. Is that advantage Chargers? And maybe. I, w- I mean, I would think so. But, man, Phillip Rivers looked old last week. I mean, he looked really old last week. Uh, against Oakland Mahomes looked you know coming off the injury looked fine and obviously that was a misleading loss for Kansas City I I don't have much coming into the game but what what I will look for is those defenses getting tired in the second half and look to play over second half I'm kind of leaning the Kansas City side here because that defense played so well in Mahomes's absence and then Mahomes comes back and they kind of shit the bed I mean to me it sort of (laughs) feels like a you know, a sack up kind of game for that Kansas City defense. There you go. You know, maybe pun intended in terms of, you know, getting after immobile Phillip Rivers. But that's kind of my thought here. But at the same time, I was burned by Kansas City last week in both contests. I don't know if I want to go back to him right away. Yeah, I think that's an excellent point. To me, that's what it looked like. Kansas City went when, uh, you know, Mahomes was gone. Everyone picked up their game, picked up their intensity when he wasn't there. And then last week, ah. Uh, well, I mean, our, our safety valve is back, so I, maybe I don't have to play as hard. I mean, if you get a full effort from Kansas City, I'd argue that defense is certainly better than last year. Tyree kills back. Remember, he missed most of the uh, the start of the season. And if Mahomes is playing at the level even of last week, and, and I don't think it gets worse from this point, where it probably gets better. How is Kansas City not a top four or five team in, in the NFL? I think it's a dangerous team moving forward. Keep in mind, after the first four weeks this year, it was New England one, Kansas City two, As far as clearly the top two teams in the NFL, that was everyone's power ratings after the first four games. Yeah. And now who's number two? New Orleans? I I, I guess. (laughs) I mean, after that performance last week, I don't know. I mean, that's one of the biggest head scratchers we've seen in the NFL probably in multiple years. Yeah, I mean, I'd certainly take them over the Niners probably. I'm not totally sold on Seattle. Uh, The NFC is going to beat each other up. Baltimore? I mean, Baltimore can make a case. Yeah, I I don't know. It's a good question. Well, a lot of good questions have answers over at bradpowersports.com. What's going on over there right now, man? Yeah, and let me just say this. This is one of my favorite segments I've done all year, so I really, really appreciate doing this one today. Not that I don't every week. I always appreciate talking to you, but this was excellent today. And if you're looking for more information, just go to bradpowersports.com. I talk about it. I mentioned it briefly and a couple times today. It's called the Powers Picks Newsletter. Every single game, as far as college and NFL, there's a write-up on it. I put my heart and soul into it. Picks of the week are in there. NFL's been really good this year. College, not so much. 
Don't buy it for the picks. Buy it for the information. It's 49 bucks all the way through the Super Bowl. Go to bradpowersports.com. And, of course, as always, you can follow Brad on Twitter at Brad Powers and the number seven. Brad, appreciate your time as always, my friend. Thank you so much for joining me. Really enjoyed this segment as well, and uh, we'll have another good one coming next week. All right. Sounds good. Take care, my friend.